It's my pleasure to introduce the second talk of the afternoon session. Lecture is by Yoni Ter Teravainen. Sorry, but I'll do my best. He, he comes to us from Finland, University of Turku, by, by way of the Institute for Advanced Study. And he will be speaking on Bateman Horn and the Hasse principle for random polynomials. Thank you very much, Ken, for the introduction. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Um, happy birthday, Andrew. It's great to be celebrating your birthday and your work here. Okay, so I'll be talking about the Bateman Horn conjecture and the Hasse principle for random polynomials. And this is based on a forthcoming joint work with Tim Browning and Ephemia Sophos. Okay, so first I'll tell you a bit about what we expect regarding prime values of polynomials. So what conjectures we have and what we can say about them for random polynomials. Secondly, I'll discuss also norm forms, evaluated polynomials, and what sort of applications that has to the Hasse principle for various surfaces, parameterized by polynomials. And time permitting, I'll tell you a bit about the proof of ingredients that go into these results as well. Okay, so that's the plan. And let's start with the basic question of, or the fundamental question of, when do we expect a polynomial to take prime values? Now, there's a conjecture of Puntikovsky from the 1850s, which answers exactly this. So Puntikovsky conjectured that if you have a polynomial with integer coefficients, and let's say our polynomial has positive leading coefficient, then as long as your polynomial is irreducible and there's no fixed prime divisor, you can say that f of n represents infinitely many prime values. And clearly those two conditions are also necessary if you have a reducible polynomial or if you have a prime p that always divides um, f of n, then you don't have primes in your sequence. So it really is a criterion. Bateman and Horn in the 1960s went even further and made a more general conjecture, which also predicts an asymptotic formula for the number of primes represented by a polynomial. So they conjecture that um, if you look at the number of um, f of n that are prime up to x and you weight it by the Fermangle function, you get an asymptotic formula of x sorry, uh, times a constant depending on the polynomial, where the constant is a singular series. So for every prime p, it takes into account the local density of solutions for the low p to f of t equals zero. Okay, so that's the conjecture. Now, almost nothing is known about this. So we only know the sort of trivial case of f being a linear polynomial. In that case, you're just asking for the prime number theorem in arithmetic progressions. But as soon as you have a nonlinear polynomial, let's say n squared plus one, we don't even know that it produces infinitely many prime values, let alone an asymptotic for it. Okay, so since this seems like a very difficult problem, uh, let's relax it and only look at almost all polynomials. So um, what do I mean by almost all polynomials? I mean the following. So um, I say that the property holds for 100% of polynomials if the number of degree d polynomials up to height h that don't satisfy the property is little low of h to the d plus one as h goes to infinity. So the height of a polynomial here is simply the maximum of the absolute values of the coefficients. And we're looking at integer polynomials in a box where all the coefficients are ranging between minus h and h and the leading coefficient is positive. Okay, so that's the um, key definition of uh, what it means to talk about almost all polynomials. We come to the uh, first main result that um, Tim and F. Timius and myself um, have proved. So this is uh, not yet published or on the archive. Um, but so we can prove that um, for almost all polynomials, you do have the Bateman-Horn asymptotic, 
with uh, quite a bit of uniformity in the error term and the number of exceptional polynomials. So it's not only little of h to the d plus one exceptional polynomials, but we can save a power of log there. And also the error term in the asymptotic saves the power of log. And what's perhaps more important is the um, range of x here. So um, you're summing up to x and you're looking at polynomials whose coefficients are in a box of size h. Um, so the smaller h is in terms of x, the more difficult the problem is because then you have less averaging to work with. So you kind of want to maximize the range of x here. And what we were able to do was uh, x can go up to a small power of h. And a couple of remarks are in order. So um, firstly, the um, amount of uniformity in the x aspect is um, also what we would get um, under zero age. So under zero age, one can show that you could take your x to go up to a to the one over 2d, essentially, um, whereas we have x going up to a to the one over 10d. And secondly, the um, error term in the asymptotic, as well as the number of exceptional polynomials, um, you can't improve on the uh, arbitrary power of log saving without saying something about zero zeros. Because if you did have a zero zero, um, and if you just looked at linear polynomials, whose um, degree one coefficient was a multiple of the Siegel modulus, then you could easily see that uh, a power of log is the best you can do there. <laughs> uh, no, no, we can't get infinitely many. So yeah, um, yeah, it, it's important that the range is finite. So, uh, but I'll come, come to uh, in a moment to how many prime values we can say. Uh, um, right, but if you're taking the degree to be one, let's say, Let's say you look, only look at degree one polynomials and you have only two coefficients to average over. Um, and you say the linear coefficient is a multiple of the Siegel modulus, then that would be a problem case. Um, I then thought about it, but I would guess there would be a similar obstruction like, yeah, maybe if you just make all the coefficients multiples of the Siegel zero, it might bias the distribution, uh -huh. but I haven't checked it. Well, you would expect that you can take H to be even a fixed number that said you just look at an individual polynomial. So basically, like if H was fixed, that would be the original Bateman horn. So we basically want to make this range kind of infinite to, to be able to actually <laughs> prove Bateman horn. So, um, and that's the reason why this result only gives you um, some number of uh, prime values for a polynomial of degree two, say, not an infinite number. Um, but coming to that, um, as a direct corollary of the result, we can say that 100% um, of polynomials of height up to h take at least a polynomial in h number of prime values. So number of prime values for a typical polynomial is at least the uh, height to some power. Uh, so, and that's the direct consequence of the result. Okay, now there's been some earlier work on um, Bateman Horn for polynomials, in particular for um, various families of special polynomials such as x to the d plus c. Um, there's results of Balestrieri and Rome and Zhou uh, who handled um, such families for almost all values of the constant c. And there's also a uh, work of Granville and Mollin about x squared plus x plus c. And there are some other results um, also about different families of polynomials. Um, and in 2020, uh, Skorbukatov and Sophos proved that the um, Bateman Horn conjecture holds for 100% polynomials. That was kind of the starting point of this work. And we've managed to um, sort of, our task was to quantify that result. How many actually prime values do you get? How much uniformity you can have in the error term as well as in the exceptional set of the result. And actually the method that we use is quite different from uh, their method. They use the circle method. Uh, you'll see later that we use the, uh, oh, we work into variance and then um, look at primes and sort of intervals and make versions to, um, to get our result. But they had a smaller range of X 
And secondly, the other aspect in which we can improve on the result of square root of n sophos is that we can freeze all but two of the coefficients of the polynomial. So we can, for example, say that the um, all but the constant coefficient and the linear coefficient are fixed, and you're only varying those two coefficients, and you can still say that almost all polynomials um, in your set satisfy Bateman Horn. Okay, so um, given that we can do um, Bateman Horn for almost all polynomials, it's natural to ask can we also get results about the level function at polynomials? Um, okay, so the level function is minus one to the number of uh, total number of prime vectors of your number n. And we want to look at the level function evaluated at polynomials. Now, it's conjectured that if you look at the level function at a polynomial, you have infinitely many sign changes in the sequence. Assuming that your polynomial is not a square of another polynomial, in which case you obviously don't have uh, sign changes or a multiple of a square of another polynomial. Um, now that's not known in general, but you can still ask for something stronger, which is the polynomial Chalo conjecture. Um, so under the same assumption, if you assume that your f is not a multiple of square of another polynomial, then the conjecture says that the uh, mean value of the little function along the polynomial averages up to zero. Okay, so that's the conjecture. Um, not much is known about that either, but slightly more than for the Bateman Horn. So um, if your polynomial factors into linear factors completely, the degree two case was handled by Terry uh, with the logarithm averaging in the sum. And the case of um, odd degrees was handled by Terry and myself, um, again with logarithm averaging, or if you just um, look at almost all x instead of every x. But as soon as you have something like n squared plus one, or let's say a cubic polynomial, um, we don't know how to show cancellation in uh, the level function of that polynomial. However, it turns out that the exact same method methods that we use for the Fermangle function work also for the Liouville function. And we get a very similar looking result where you have the same kind of exponential set and you have the same um, bound. It's just that you don't have the main term for the sum of the Liouville function at the polynomials. Okay, so since we can do Fermangle and we can do Liouville, you can ask what other functions can we do? And a natural family of functions to look at are norm forms. So what can we say about norm forms evaluated at polynomials? Okay, so let's fix some number field um, k and call nk of x the corresponding norm form. So for example, if we have the uh, imaginary uh, or the quadratic field uh, q squared of t, then the norm form would be just x1 squared minus d x2 squared. So we have some polynomial in several variables and we're asking for prime values of that. Now by rk of n, I denote the uh, representation function of your norm form. So how many uh, integer um, um, points you have in your um, extension which have the given norm. So that's rk of n. And um, so our method indeed also applies to this setting and we can get an asymptotic formula for um, the sum of uh, RK of F of N. So representing uh, F of N as a value of the norm form. And again, with similar um, ranges of X in terms of H and a similar exceptional set, it says that the asymptotic formula looks a bit more complicated. Um, so I haven't written it down here. Um, but again, it's a local product of the individual densities for every prime. So you just multiply those together. So this result has some applications to um, the Hasse principle. So if we have a polynomial in several variables, the Hasse principle is the statement which, depending on your polynomial equation, may or may not be true that if it has a solution in the real numbers, 
And if there's also a solution in the periodic numbers for every prime, then it has a solution in the rationals. Now that's known in uh, for several families of polynomials for quadratic forms, that's the classical case, for cubic forms in at least nine variables, that's a result of Hooley. Um, but it's also known that it fails in many cases. For example, for this particular surface, you don't have a Hasse principle. So it may or may not hold depending on your polynomial equation that you're looking at. Using the result that we have about norm forms, we can show that if we look at surfaces of the form, the norm form of a number field equals to a polynomial, and we look at only almost all polynomials, then we can show that the Hasse principle holds for these surfaces. So 100% of surfaces of this form where the variable is the polynomial satisfy the Hasse principle. And a special case of such surfaces are what are called the generalized Chatelet surfaces. So if you just take your um, norm form to be x squared minus dy squared, and you equate that with a polynomial, um, you can show that for almost all sorts of the polynomial, you have the Hasse principle holding for that. Okay, and the um, earlier was known that you have a positive proportion of such surfaces satisfying the Hasse principle. So that followed from the work of Scott and Sophos, but now we can do 100% of them. And also similarly, we could do the integral Hasse principle. So if you look at um, integer solutions, and if you know that you have a solution in the reals and in the periodic uh, ZP, then you should have a solution in, in Z as well. And this, uh, a similar argument shows that that also holds for 100% of these surfaces. Now, finally, one can ask, can we even go beyond Hasse principle and say something more about the number of rational points that you have on your surface? So kind of the best thing that you could hope for is if the solutions were Zariski dense. So if sort of outside of any lower degree surface, you could find some points. Okay, so in particular, if you had Zariski density of the solutions, it would mean that the um, rational points are not contained in any curve. So there couldn't be any curve that contains all of your points. Regarding this, we can prove something. And here is actually important that we have this range of uniformity that X was allowed to be a power of H in our main theorems. Um, so we can say that 100% of these surfaces norm equals a polynomial. Um, okay, so if you look at those that do have a rational point, out of them, 100% have the stronger property that um, the solutions are not contained in any irreducible projective curve um, in P n plus one, where n is fixed. And if the degree is large enough, but bounded. And the reason for this is that we have um, bounds for the number of rational points on such a curve. And if the degree goes to infinity, the number of solutions up to x um, decays as the power of x uh, decays. And since we get a polynomial number of points on the surface, as soon as the degree is large enough, um, it can't be that all of them are contained in this curve, which only contains too few points to, to contain all of our points. Some, seven minutes, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, finally, um, a bit about the proof. So let's first focus on the case of polynomial Chaula. So if you want to prove an almost all result, it's natural to average over the polynomials. So you look at the L2 average of my capital F here is now the Liouville function. And you look at the L2 average of the Liouville function at polynomials. And if you can get cancellation in that average, it automatically means that almost all of your sums are small, which is exactly what we want. Uh, so SD of H here is the set of polynomials of degree D and height up to H. Um, okay, so if we expand on the square, send the other summation, do a bit of linear algebra manipulation. And also um, there's some results about the anatomy of divisors that go in, what we can prove. And this is kind of one of the key technical propositions is that we can reduce cancellation in such uh, this kind of average over the polynomials to bounding 
the um, mean value of your function in short segments and arithmetic progressions simultaneously. So if you can get cancellation in the sums of f in short intervals and arithmetic progressions simultaneously, then you can get the result about the L2 norm. Um, now, there's a slight twist, which is that we don't know if that's a bound for every um, modulus, if you have the Fermanagh function here or the Liouville function, because we allow our um, modulus to go up to x to the delta, and we could have zero zeros. But turns out it's OK for the proof if there are only a few bad moduli for which you don't have such an asymptotic. So you can throw things like zero zeros there, and you can also use zeroness the estimates to say that um, there are not too many moduli for which you have a bad zero free region. And for all the others, you can prove such an estimate um, basically by following the uh, proof of Huxley's um, primary theorem in short intervals. Okay, so we can show that there's very few exceptional moduli, and that's enough for uh, proving such a statement. Now, what about the other functions? So if you have the form angle function, you just take a suitable model function for the form angle function for which it's easy to evaluate the um, mean value along polynomials, and you take form angled minus that function. And the simple function is um, if you take just the indicator of numbers that have no small prime factors and you normalize it. So this is the uh, Granville Grammar model um, for the primes. And then if you apply exact, the exact same strategy, what you're left with is understanding just how often f of n has no small prime factors. And this can be estimated by a simple sieve argument. And that what explains your main term. So that's where the main term of the single series comes for the case of Bateman. And for the norm forms, you would again cook up some model, which is kind of a double trick, w tricked version of your function. So you're taking into, into account the um, distribution of the representation function modulo the small prime powers, and you kind of multiply those together to get some sort of approximate for your function. And for this function, we are able to show bounds on the short sums in progressions. Um, using quite a bit of theory of norm forms. And so that's exactly the ingredient that we need for um, getting the L2 estimate. And then uh, using a bit more theory of norm forms, we can actually also evaluate the, um, the contribution of the local models. So how often the local model is equal to a polynomial value. And that again gives us the main term for the norm forms result. Okay, so. That's very briefly how the arguments go. And I think um, that's all that I want to say. And again, happy birthday, Andrew. Excellent talk. Questions for Yoni? Questions or comments? Yeah, so if I understand correctly at the end here, um, the analytic argument for capital F, it's got, there's no arithmetic in it. It's just mean square, change variable. Yeah, uh, there's... Essentially, there's a bit to do with kind of the uh, typical devices of polynomials. We need to know something about the devices of the polynomials that they're not too concentrated in certain sets. But yeah, just yeah. saying for big F, you're not using any assumption other than yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's control. it's for a completely arbitrary function F. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you could write this. Do you really need some sub, sub or just some sum? Could it just be level of distribution kind of hypothesis? For um. Yeah, except that kind of Bombier-Vinogradov is not strong enough. Like the exceptional set there would be too large because, right. okay, I didn't say what the exceptional set should be, but what it should be here is kind of that if if you take the sum of one over Q to the epsilon over your bad moduli, that's what converts for any epsilon. So it should be a relatively small set. Uh, like, yeah, so smaller than the Bombier-Vinogradov, but it, it's kind of uh, a generalization of a uh, level of distribution estimate. You, you have way too high expectations of what how small a set you're always getting in your papers. But <laughs> um, yeah, so, okay, you didn't say what delta is, but I guess my real question is how much of this these difficulties disappear if you don't worry about getting such a great range as h to the one over d plus one? Right, yeah. Um, then many of the um, difficulties with the uh, sort of 
primary theorem in short intervals and zero energy estimates would disappear. Um, and I think it would give a slightly cleaner version of the, uh, a different argument for the score of of Sophos result. If you just looked at, um, let's say you wanted just a little low saving, you didn't need to look at um, short intervals or progressions to too high moduli. So uh, those things would disappear. Yeah. yeah. Just you want to do the best possible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Yoni. Um, so when the degree is two, can you get better ranges? Um, or is it the same result for all degrees? We haven't tried, but there's some work on the degree two case. Uh, at least Stefan Bayer has some papers about that. Um, yeah, but we just looked at the case of high degrees and didn't focus too much on the low degree case. So, um, yeah, I don't think our results would be any stronger there. Um, what happens if you replace n with a prime number? Can you handle this case? If you replace a polynomial with a prime no, number? No, the polynomial, the argument of the polynomial, the, the argument of the polynomial. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, right. Um, Right. Um, I think we could say something about that as well, because it would kind of involve, okay, so we would have like, let's say, from angles of n times f of fn, kind of, because you want n to be a prime. And when you multiply out the mean square, you take the n sum outside. So it doesn't really matter too much if there's a full angle function in front of it, because you really get your cancellation from the sum over the polynomials and not from the n sum. So I think that might just work and give a result for uh, f of p as well. So it's likely to hold for many other sequences of arguments. Any further questions for all, all the way over there? Okay. Oh, there is. Can someone, help? there's a microphone. Yeah. So I have a very similar question, but I was wondering. Can can your method say something if you put two norm forms equal? Especially do your method see, for example, if I have a norm form defined by K, number field K, and another one by number field L, if I know one is extension of the other one, can your method see the relationship between K and L and maybe say something about Hesse principle there? Um, well, I guess it would say something about the situation because you can always fix several variables of your other norm form to make it just a single variable. Polynomial, um, do you mean you would vary the coefficients of the norm form? Oh, okay, so it would kind of average over number fields. Um, yeah, I haven't really thought about that. that. That's a good question. So could one average over number fields as well? It would kind of depend on what the coefficients look like for the norm form. Um, yeah, but I haven't really thought about it. It's a good question. Any further questions? Or if not, let's thank Yoni for an excellent talk.